A very good evening to all of you from Bhangur Mahavidyalaya. Today, the Department of English, in collaboration with IQSC, is organizing a webinar on arts and letters representations in sickness. In times like ours, perhaps such a topic not only deserves discussion, but perhaps this is the way we can help ourselves cope with things. Both our speakers would include Tagore and Shakespeare, two people who in their own personal life had faced the pandemic and faced it so bravely. Before much ado, I would welcome our principal sir to give the welcome address for the webinar, which happens to be seventh in the series that the college is organizing. Dr. Veer Bikram Roy, Principal Bhangar Mohabitala. Thank you. Thank you, Molimita. I welcome the honorable speakers, participants, and students to the seventh webinar organized by Bhangar Mohabitala. I would specially mention the efforts of the English department for arranging a webinar which is very relevant in this all-pervading atmosphere of sickness. We all know that art and literature flourish mostly during the time of peace and prosperity. But on the other hand, art and literature may also grow during sickness and illness and represent sickness and illness, sickness of all kinds, mental, physical, social, and political. In this respect, I would take two minutes to refer to uh, a very famous novel by Camus, The Plague, which portrays the helplessness of the individual and which strangely foreshadows the present time when amidst lockdown and chaos, humanity seems to be the only panacea. On the other hand, we have also read the famous cricketer, Jubraj Singh's biopic, the book, The Taste of My Life, an inspirational story that represents his flight on the field and off the field, a fight against cancer. Uh, so far uh, about the letters, in arts also, in painting, we have come across the famous painting called The Miracles of Saint Francis Xavier by Rubens, where the saint is shown uh, curing plague patients. And nearer home, we all know our own uh, domestic goddess, goddesses, Shitala, who is a representative of smallpox. Uh, examples may be compounded, but I am not the speaker here. I welcome Dr. Shodmishta Chakravarti Srivastava of Alia University, and I give over the platform to her. I welcome her. I also welcome Dr. Shubhujit, uh, who is not here in the platform, who will join here uh, in, a, in some time. I welcome both the speakers, and we look forward to a very healthy and encouraging discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, I must begin by saying that uh, I'm grateful. Uh, so, to... Mr. May I just give a brief introduction to you? Yeah, I mean, sure, I, I, sure. Would you, would you let me have the honor, please? Yes. Um, please. So, thank you so much, uh, uh, Principal, sir. And it is an extreme honor to welcome Dr. Shormishta Chatterjee Srivastava to this webinar. She is an associate professor in English at Alia University, Kolkata, West Bengal. Her areas of interest include South Asian literature, translation studies, post-colonialism, partition, eco-criticism, gender studies, 
modern linguistics and English language teaching. Dr. Chatterjee has been the trainer associate from 2007 to 2013 in the UGC program, Capacity Building for Women Managers in Higher Education. Recipient of UGC travel grant, she has traveled to parts of Europe to present her papers. She has authored and edited books on translations and translation studies, post-colonialism and language studies. This apart, she has been published widely in national and international books and journals. Her latest book on English communication has been published by Cambridge, UK. Currently, she is teacher coordinator and resource person in the People's Project on Partition and Inlo Bangladesh Endeavor under the aegis of Center of Languages Translation and Cultural Studies, Netaji Open University, Kolkata. Apart from that, uh, you know, she is, you know, a known academician. Today, the title of her talk is titled Of Sickness, Pestilence, Arts and Letters. And I welcome Dr. Srivasta once again to the webinar. The floor is yours, ma'am. Welcome once again. Thank you. Thank you, Madhumita, for all those kind words. I must definitely begin by saying that uh, I am grateful to Dr. Beer Vikram Roy, the principal of this Mohabiddaloy, Bhangur Mohabiddaloy, who actually encouraged me to think about a relevant topic for the contemporary times and uh, share it with many if possible. My thanks also goes to Dr. Madhumita Mojumdar. Who quiet, whose quiet but untiring efforts, I should say, uh, is making this webinar happen. Uh, Modhumita has already introduced my topic uh, to you. It is uh, of sickness, pestilence, and literature. And I look at it from various perspectives, and I try to see uh, how literature definitely uh, represents uh, sickness and pestilence. But also, is it uh, a literal representation only? Or is it symptomatic of uh, certain other underlying truths or political or social turmoils, as Dr. Beer Vikram um, uh, Roy had also been hinting at? And the, he has actually struck the right chord. So I'm, I'm going to begin with uh, a reference to an incident, uh, a ship carrying Indian troops from the World War uh, first one docked at the port of Bombay on 29th May 1918. When it secretly arrived, uh, the H1N1 influenza virus soon it spread across Bombay and traveled by train to the rest of the country. The war fever, as this new disease was then called, killed about 18 million people. Until the end of 1920 in India alone. This number exceeded even the total number of lives lost in the war. The situation was exacerbated by negligence on the part of colonial rulers who did nothing to provide the people with food in the face of a famine caused by drought. Reckless swindling of food grains out of India only made the rapidly deteriorating condition much worse. There were few doctors to attend the ailing, as most of them were on war duty. The dying died with nearly no help. For those who are interested in the history before the partition of India will also know that uh, there is a documentation of a similar kind of a famine occurring for colonial negligence uh, even during the Second World War. And that is how the partition also suffered a lot and came about. So keeping that apart, we carry on. Uh, the fever, this fever or this HINI influenza virus, which had entered through the docks, this fever also entered into the Gurukul school, which was uh, run by Rabindranath Tagore at Shanti Niketan Bolpur. The medical facilities were poor. In a letter, Tagore wrote, I quote, this place Shanti Niketan 
has only Kitimohan Babu, and Kitimohan Babu is the grandfather, was the grandfather of Amurtu Shin. And uh, I, he writes for doctor, unquote. The poet, who had great interest in medicine since boyhood, now felt compelled to put his knowledge to the practice for the, the, the sake of the inmates. He personally visited all the afflicted students every day to inquire about their health and hygiene. He prepared an Ayurvedic concoction. He called it uh, Ponchotikto Ponchon from various Ayurvedic ingredients, you know, like uh, Nishinda, Guloncho, and so on and so forth, Thanpuni. And he mandatorily gave uh, it to all the inmates. On uh, 1st January 1919, he wrote to Jagadish Chandra Bosch, I quote, none of the boys has got the influenza. I believe it is so because I have been regularly giving them Pancho Tikto Pancho. Many of the boys had suffered from the disease during their stay at home in the holidays. Some of them are from the hotspots of the disease and I have survived it. I was afraid that they would inadvertently spread the disease here on their return. But nothing of that sort has happened. And Tagore believed that this is because of the ponchon that he had made. Reference to the above incident uh, basically proves or uh, uh, establishes that the poet was aware and actively engaged in combating epidemic during his times. As Tagore's life reveals, many of his near and dear ones, we all know, you know, Kadumburi Devi, Minanini Devi, were often on afflicted with pestilence like smallpox or influenza, and many succumbed to it. But death and disease could not cover the poet and his creativity. Although it did express his pain symbolically and obliquely in his writings. In the 1860s and 70s, when the poet was an adolescent, cholera and plague, along with smallpox, the most aggressive killers. In 1880s, Louis Pasteur developed vaccines for chicken cholera as well as smallpox. But decades would go before diseases like measles, mumps, polio, and diphtheria could be controlled through successive mass vaccination. Even so, the rate of inoculation was far from widespread or equitable. That's the question over here. That's the important point, that it was not equitable. And in undivided India, for instance, uh, the ruled, the rich, uh, they got the privileges and not the poor. And the rich also included the Tagore household. So Tagore, in a way, you know, he felt responsible for this huge, inequitable distribution of uh, medicines or of cure for the uh, sicknesses and the pestilence. The poor, both in urban and rural areas, faced the wrath of epidemics like bubonic plague of 1896 and 98. Tagore was acutely aware of this injustice, this injustice and this divide between the rich and the poor. Therefore, as a short of wish fulfillment in 1916, his novel Choturango. In his novel Choturango, an affluent man turns his home into an infirmary for the destitute. So what Tagore uh, tried to actually, he, he wanted to bridge the gap in his writings. That which he probably could never do in a mass scale. Yes, he had his hostels, he had his inmates, but in a mass scale, he could never do it. That he did through his writings. Uh, so so uh, he, he, he turns, the protagonist turns his home into an infirmary as the plague breaks out and eventually succumbs to the disease that he contracts while nursing the sick. In another of his poems, and this is known to many, Puraton Vritto, an old servant. Uh, uh, the plays, the, the pox plays a crucial role as a leveler between the classes, showing up the hierarchies internalized by societies during Tagore's times. Again, the divide between the rich and the poor. So my point is that the pestilence or the, 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 the presentation of sickness becomes a, a marker or an indicator of basically the social maladies that were infesting the days. Composed in 1895, the poem tells of the story of Kishta, a servant in the rich man's home who shows unflinching loyalty 
by nursing his master back to health from the deadly epidemic while himself succumbing to it although casual violence towards service staff was common in his time tagore basically reminiscences and writes of a huge retinue of servants whom he he loved he cared for because in absence of his mother uh, during his early childhood it is this retinue of servants who looked after him so you see he fondly remembers them for uh, him uh, they were his world uh, but uh, uh, you see the the outer world or you know beyond the tigor household things were different the reality was different or one on the writings of the poet about death and disease show his awareness and concern as a landed gentry and also as an individual about the seriousness of such occasions on the other hand these writings become a plea for exposing the injustices of the society and as i repeat yawning gap between the rich and the poor tagore's writings become all the more relevant today in relation to the treatment of the migrants the migrants who constantly had a few days ago come in trains before that they had traveled horribly uh, through vast distances have been suffering so much and how sometimes we have been extremely apathetic towards them so tagore's feelings for the poor and the downtrodden bring up these contemporary issues so uh for those of us who have read just to shift away the basics of psychoanalysis the creative process is according to the very old freud we know an alternative to neurosis that is the defense mechanism projecting against uh neurosis leading us to the production of socially ac- acceptable source of aesthetic pleasure for others for the artist who has the ability to turning these fantasies and fears into artistic creations instead of being afflicted by them that we uh, most of us we know as sublimation my point is that you see tagore was probably practicing this like all other artists you know a, a kind of uh, transforming his his fears his anxieties his uh, his guilt into many such creative projects tagore writes in my reminiscences uh, the loss of kadambori kadambori his beloved sister in law was his first mature experience of death i quote in translation i was unaware then of the slightest lack of anything in my life there seemed to be no loophole in its tightly woven fabric of laughter and tears nothing was visible beyond it hence i had accepted it as the ultimate truth and then that suddenly arrived from somewhere in a single instant it tore away one end of this very visible fabric of life how bewildered i felt now on court yet to the challenge of death tagore responded with an ecstatic intuitive affirmation of being i quote again emptiness is a thing man cannot bring himself to believe in and this is we what we should learn you know the quiet acceptance that which is not is untrue that which is untrue is not so our efforts to find something where we see nothing are unceasing so this positive spirit unquote he explained that two years before his death in 1939 in an essay called travel the poet affirms that is why the call of death is nothing but the same call to change one's abode those of you who know gitanjali would know his idea of transcendentalism of the soul traveling from one vehicle to the other so there's no death this positive spirit that is what tagore sustained all throughout his life notwithstanding the fact that the portrayal of epidemics and illnesses in literature has largely been a eurocentric discourse of course you know they they were there all around as plagues as as uh principal sir has already mentioned famous the plague very importantly okay. there are ample examples like like tagore's i would say of the indian engagement with the concept of pestilence and i would read it as plague for convenience and what is it is symptomatic of the hindi poet 
Suryakant Tripathi's memoir, A Life Misspent, provides a heart-rending account of influenza epidemic that ravaged India during the early years of the 20th century. He writes, I traveled to the river bank in Dalmau and waited. The Ganga was swollen with the dead bodies. At my mother-in-law's house, I learned that my wife had passed away, unquote. Those who are familiar with Sharad Chandra will know that uh, malaria always manifested in his uh, works. You know, his central protagonists like Ramesh in Polli Shamaj, Brindabon in uh, Pondit Moshai, or Srikanto in Srikanto, they, uh, they go beyond the social hierarchies, you know, in order to, uh, in order to uh, fight against uh, the plague, taking up the arduous task of sustaining the villagers, resusticating them, those who reel under the grip of pestilence. So more than diseases being personal tragedies, these authors depict them as instruments of negotiating social hierarchies and delineate the sufferings of the poor and the downtrodden. So here we see, you know, uh, there are uh, uncanny, you know, uh, similarities between the Indian authors who are um, writing uh, about sicknesses. The religious and the cultural aspect is explored too, and the uh, principal has given a hint of it. When such diseases are linked to the wrath of the deities who sent plague, cholera, or smallpox. I think those who uh, are Bengali speakers will know uh, pox is known as Mayad Doya. So you see, there is a Ma behind, you know, um, Devota, Devi behind the coming of the pox. In rural Bengal, offerings were made to Olya, Bibi, Shitola, Monosha, Bono Bibi, Olai Chundi, and others to, uh, to appease the gods and prevent diseases. Ola Otharog, you know, you must have heard about it. Interestingly, plague being the scourge of the divinities is an ubiquitous, uh, uh, is, 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 is an ubiquitous discourse around the world. Such sufferings are usually comprehended as being sent as punishments for the sins of humankind. The pall of ignorance that loomed over the common villagers in the 19th and the early 20th century India resulted in the convenient narrative of the scourge of gods. While such plagues were actually, that I have referred to in the beginning, you know, the effect of colonial misrule and nonchalance. That is the reality. It is not that the Europeans were unaware of the responsibility in spawning diseases. The outbreak of epidemics in the colonized space was often interpreted as a problematic reversal of the aggressive act of subjugation by the colonizers. The white man's burden, a self-inflicted responsibility, came not without its share of cholera, smallpox, flu, dysentery, tuberculosis. And uh, Rudyard Kipling, in 1884, is once writing to his aunt. Uh, he's articulating his fears, and he's writing, as you are 7,000 miles away, I don't mind telling you that there has been a case of sporadic cholera already. And as this is the third year, since we had the last epidemic, we are anticipating a festive season later on, unquote. I shift now, you know, I, I try to make a comparative, you know, assessment of, uh, of the, the depiction of the disease or the plague as uh, we take it as a kind of a symbolic term in the East and the West. So I move, how do we tackle it in the West? While in the East, the epidemics become symptomatic of the tussle between classes and castes, between the colonizer and the colonized. In the West, the epidemic or the plague, as it was commonly known as, indicates the accumulation. These are in the earlier, you know, classical writings, uh, the, uh, the dominant discourses during that time, you know. So it indicates the accumulation of immorality and sinfulness within the body polity. A significant example. Uh, a very common example being Oedipus Rex by Sophocles, where the city suffers because of the ruler's sin. Judging from the role of plague in Western literature up to the present, this metaphor is endowed with an almost incredible vitality in a world where the plague has once more struck and struck in our world, read this as COVID, after a long gap. 
such vitality would be unthinkable of course if the social plague were not always with us as fear or as reality in some form or the other indeed an analysis of significant texts reveals definite analogies between the plague or rather all great epidemics and social phenomena real or imagined that are assimilated to them one such text belongs to dostoevsky's crime and punishment raskolnikov the protagonist has a dream that during a grave illness that occurs just before his final change of heart at the end of the novel he dreams of a worldwide plague that affects people's relationships with each other uh, no specifically medical symptoms are mentioned it is human interaction that breaks down and the entire society gradually collapses he dreamed that the whole world was condemned to a terrible new strange plague that had come to europe from the depths of asia somehow so very prophetic from the depths of asia and uh, we have seen nowadays you know there are so many these popular writings you know i'll refer to them who who also uh, uncannily had predicted that such a kind of a uh, thing would come from asia so i continue men attacked by them became at once mad and furious and killed each other so the outcome is something different so men became mad uh, madness by the way in literature is uh, uh, an ubiquitous kind of i would say a pattern you know a, a kind of sickness so in a manner of science fiction it is rationality and the intellect of the humans that the plague attacks this is in crime and punishment the conclusion of raskolnikov's dream resembles the old testament story of floods and the building of noah's ark i quote only a few men could be saved in the whole world they were a pure chosen people destined to find a new race and a new life to renew and purify the earth unquote therefore so please again you know the idea that plague is symptomatic of the rottenness as the rottenness in denmark of hamlet note that the ending of raskolnikov's discourse is apocalyptic giving the discourse a distinct ethical touch raskolnikov's dream probably has the same potency as the books nowadays viral on social media predicting the outbreak of covid-19 mm. one or two books end of days by late selvia brown or 1981 novel title the eyes of darkness by dean kuns apparently this book by dean kuns had also predicted that the disease would originate in china interesting what is missing from these popular fictions is the ability to link the illness with a graver turmoil the ethical and the moral decay within the society the the uh, uh, the skewed perspective and the anthropocentric Uh, attitude which is leading to it yes they have they have thought about it but the ethical definitely the ethical idea is missing definitely uh, classics they however continue to use the plague as a metaphor like artus antony nathuds la theater et le pes and i quote from there the theater like the plague is a crisis which is resolved by death or cure and the plague is a superior disease because it is a total crisis after which remains except death or an extreme purification that itself appears as a purifying agent sometimes of a single chosen victim who seems to assume the plague in its entirety and whose death or expulsion cures the society like oedipus rex his expulsion will cure the society in the rituals of much of the world sacrifices like that predicted in oedipus rex are prescribed in a community stricken by the plague or other scourges unquote this thematic cluster is even more powerful in myth and ritual than in literature although they do find a way in european literature of now in exodus for instance we find the 10 plagues there are worsening breakdown which also appears in form of the destructive rivalry between moses and the magicians of egypt remember that where you know the uh, magicians turned their uh, their uh, sticks into snakes and the moses was asked to tackle them so 
in that discourse you know we also know about the strong sacrificial theme of the death of the first born and the establishment of the passover ritual the tragic conflict and the plague are also in a metaphorical relationship in shakespeare and here i move on to you know shakespeare and we compare him to tagore and the others so and also to dostoevsky shakespeare lived his entire life in the shadow of bubonic plague such plague outbreaks did not rage on forever with the help of the strict quarantine and the change in the weather the epidemic would slowly wane as it did in stratford and life would resume its normal course but after an interval of a few years in cities and towns throughout the realm the plague would return and it was terrifyingly contagious this is a common information innumerable preventive measures were proposed most of which were useless as a shareholder and sometime actor in his playing company as well as principal playwright shakespeare had to grapple throughout his career with these repeated economically devastated closings there were particularly several outbreaks of plague in 1582 92 603 606 608 the theater historian j leeds barrol concluded that in years between 1606 and 1610 the period in which shakespeare wrote and produced some of his greatest plays from macbeth and antony and cleopatra to the winter's tale and the tempest the london playhouses were not likely to have been open for more than a total of 9 months so see opposite to the assumption that we write only in happiness a uh, crisis also also inspires writing It is strange that Shakespeare in his plays and poems almost never directly and like Tagore represented the plague nothing as Thomas Nash wrote a litany in the time of plague i quote rich men trust not in wealth gold cannot buy you health physic himself must must fade all things to end are made the plague full swift goes by i am sick i must die a lord of mercy on us and quote In Shakespeare the epidemic disease is present for most part a steady low level undertone surfacing in his character speeches most vividly in metaphorical expressions of rage and disgust the plague therefore becomes Shakespeare for Shakespeare a psychic turbulence a mental anxiety for Shakespeare therefore the plague becomes an anxiety propelling his finest creations of his lifetime there is definitely an association between mental illness and creativity which appeared in literature in 1970s just as the link between madness and genius those who know the uh, very famous character in 12th night you know of the comic uh, uh, olivia stewart you know so malvolio you know you know that he is this epitome of madness so mm, this i was saying that you know the link between madness and genius which is much older dating back at least to the time of aristotle one might remember the relevant lines also probably coleridge scubla khan a code beware beware his flashing eye students must have read this his floating hair we were circle round him thrice and close your eyes with holy dread for he on honey dew hath fed and drunk the milk of paradise while the ancient greeks believed that creativity came from the gods in particular the the muses as in paradise lost book 1 in the aristotelian tradition conversely genius was viewed from a physiological standpoint and it was believed that the same human quality was perhaps responsible for both extraordinary achievement and melancholy elements of uh romantic writers had similar ideals with lord byron having pleasantly expressed we of the craft are all crazy some are affected by gaiety others by melancholy but all the more or less touched in our book touched with fire and this is common in the you know in the internet you can find it American clinical psychologist K Redfield Jamison wrote that 38% of writers and poets had been treated for a type of mood disorder and virtually all creative writers and artists had experienced intense highly productive and creative episodes 
these were characterized by pronounced increases in enthusiasm energy self confidence speed of mental association fluency of thought and elevated mood my point is that to prove to you how you know mental pressure anxiety and also disorders can lead to creativity as also in shakespeare like all other arts people of arts and letters often flights of ideas faster thought processes and ability to take in more information can be converted to art poetry or design uh principal sir had mentioned some of the famous people i mentioned the dutch artist vincent van gogh he is supposed supposed to have suffered from mental disorder scholars have also speculated that the visual artist michael angelo lived with depression in his book famous depressives 10 historical sketches mj van lieberg argues that elements of depression are prominent in some michael angelo sculptures and poetry in the same manner as the anxiety of plague features in shakespeare in a letter michael angelo writes i lead a miserable existence and reckless rot of life nor honor that is of this world i live wearied by stupendous labors and beset by a thousand anxieties and thus i lived for some 15 years now and never an hour's happiness have i had and it is the same michael angelo who painted and sculpted the churches he made the david with the pandemic having struck us badly and brewing a series of suicides it worth it's worth taking a look at an alternative possibility how can you channelize yourself into meaningful things in a way great writers to convert their psychological troubles into creativity shakespeare's anxiety thus with the plague surfaces in his dialogues mortally wounded in a feud between capulets and the montagues mercutio calls down a plague on both your houses lear very important of his plays during the pandemics he says to goneril thou art a boil a plague sore or embossed carbuncle in my corrupted boil coriolanus shouts at the plebians you heard of boils and plagues plaster you over that you may be abhorred farther than seen and one inflict another against the wind a miry plague constantly appears throughout shakespeare's work in form of everyday exclamations a plague upon it when thieves cannot be true to one another a plague of this pickle hearing a plague upon this howling but this is a sign less of existential horror plague is by now become a part part you know of his creativity part of his life uh this is a sense of deep familiarity in fact the acceptance of plague as a feature of ordinary life uh, modavita do i have about 5 6 minutes more uh modavita are you there okay carry on carry on maybe i have 5 6 minutes more uh, so so it sometimes becomes also comic in shakespeare you know when beatrice mocks what is to be friend, befriended by benedict in much ado about nothing and he says oh lord he will hang upon him like a disease he sooner caught than the pestil- pestilence and the taker runs presently mad unquote shakespeare's treatment and acceptance of the plague should be a lesson learned for those who fail to cope up with this new normal in our times do we then brand shakespeare as an escapist maybe not I'll shorten, but I'll mention just one play where the plague is an actual, I would say, uh, a protagonist in a way, an actual participant. Uh, that in Romeo and Juliet, where you see the uh, fellow Frere is asked to deliver a crucial message to Romeo, uh, and where you know the message to be delivered is that you know uh, Juliet is uh, 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 is going to be given a drug where she will appear to be dead, but she will not be dead. so romeo shouldn't mistake her to be dead and you see uh, this frere uh, was trying to go out barefoot to find you know and uh, the frere couldn't by the way travel alone because of this franciscan order you know he had to take another monk with him and you know it is during this time that uh, uh, the plague uh, showed up 
and and this this uh, uh, these two monks were caught by the authorities and uh, they felt that the searches of the town felt that they could have contaminated plague so they were put in quarantine and these two frères couldn't go and the letter was never delivered and uh, when frère lawrence who had given the letter to the other frère you know asks uh, him who bear i am quoting who bear my letter then to romeo and receives a dismaying answer i could not send it here it is again nor get a messenger to bring it thee so fearful were they of infection the infection of plague not only did the message never reach romeo and mantua but the confined frere they could not get any one even to return the undelivered letter to frere lawrence and warn him of the problem the crucial interval of time basically kills the lovers the tangle of unfortunate circumstances leads to the suicides of both romeo and juliet the plague which is hardly represented in the play does not cause their deaths but the profound social disruption it brings in its wake plays an oddly significant role in bringing about the tragic turn of events i have come almost to the end of it uh there is one more passage a passage from macbeth in shakespeare uh which is an emotional outburst you know say this was during the time of horrendous plague in 1603 to 4 when elizabeth the first died and also it delayed the coronation of james the first uh the lines are uh, my students will know i quote just a few lines alas poor country almost afraid to know itself it cannot be called our mother but our grave where nothing but who knows nothing is one skin to smile where sighs and groans and shrieks that rend the air are made not marked where violent sorrow seems a modern ecstasy and it goes on and on and on the words which would have perfectly captured the inescapable presence of an epidemic actually turns out to be the description of a country in the grip of a vicious ruler that is macbeth therefore once again as in most cases the real existent plague becomes a metaphor a manifestation of a sacrilege underneath which festers the body politic modumita uh, five minutes more can yes, i have yes yes of five, course five absolutely, minutes, absolutely, okay. absolutely five minutes absolutely. okay uh shubhajit the uh, shubhajit welcome okay thanks for joining thank you uh, i'm sorry i joined late uh, no it's okay thank please you. my pleasure to meet you uh, i just continue this last part Please, please, having said you. that yeah, yeah having said that shakespeare had made peace with diseases and death possibly nowhere so pronounced as in hamlet where the grave diggers sing as they dig graves for the imminent dead the primary lesson of plague literature therefore from thucydides onwards therefore is how predictably humans respond to such crises over millennia there has been a consistent pattern of behavior during epidemics for common mm-hmm. people the hoarding the panicking the fear the blaming the superstition the selfishness the surprising heroism the fixation with numbers of the reported dead the boredom during quarantine i just refer uh, to defos the journal of a journal of a plague year which stands testimony to this during those times too many families he writes forcing the approach of the distemper laid up stories of prov- provisions sufficient for the whole families and shut themselves up and that so entirely that neither seen or heard of till infection quite ceased and this i found was very interesting and because you see uh, we too during our times we hoard and hoard and hoard uh, people carrying away 20 kg of atta when they need only 1 kg and uh, uh, locking themselves behind their homes so this kind of a panic the journal was a record of the bubonic plague in marseille in 1720 even before the germ theory devos common sense and perceived perceptiveness led him to conclusions of which our chief medical officer would approve he gives a prescient warning about the danger of asymptomatic carriers i quote the plague is not to be avoided by those that converse promiscuously in a town infected and people have it when they know it not and that they likewise give it to others when they know not that they have it themselves unquote if human behavior remains dismayingly constant one thing has changed for the better 
that is science and our understanding of it yet whether it is man's death in venice i could have talked on and on but there's no time so so just passing references camus the plague of course shakespeare to tagore the plague remains as as a as a, a palpable and a terrible mystery a pale horse a great leveler something that strips away vanity and reveals unpalatable truths in spite of so so what does what is in conclusion literature doing for us or arts and letters doing for us uh, in spite of difficulties fears and anxieties literature records chronicles and preserves these pains expressions and emotions in times of pestilence it offers us support in times of need knowledge in times of ignorance by drawing upon precedences and ultimately offers for human kind lessons to be learned from their past mistakes be it as personal as incest in oedipus or as public as anthropocene in the great derangement by amitabh ghosh those lessons which would help mankind try to avert such disasters in future thank you uh thank you uh for mr di for that wonderful lecture i wish we had some more time uh, with us you know we could have heard more about that we do have a few questions um i'm putting the question forward on the screen for you yes uh the question is from my young colleague in the department devdut mukherjee he wants to know or his question is how do you think representation of touch will change post covid in literature will there be a loneliness and segregation even more pronounced than that we have had till pre covid mm, this is an intelligent question of course you see uh, the presentation of touch of course yeah, or or you know of no touch if you say so you know uh, there will be definitely an idea that there could be loneliness and segregation uh, but you see uh, we are probably you know a literature could probably hint at that there are many other ways of connecting as we are connecting now uh, i do not probably think that you know uh, this absence of touch you know or you know uh, if you say absence of touch or this touch which we are touching over our speaking to each other in this way okay whatever way you interpret it uh, uh, there will be alternative strategies i would say uh, literature will cope up with it and show us strategies in which to remain as a society bound to each other it's only that you know uh, we will think about it in different ways to connect to each other uh, what was probably physical tender um, would now have to be more uh, visual i mean uh, that would be my interpretation um, yes uh, i i don't think probably literature can afford to look into loneliness and segregation it will it will cope up that's it uh, thank you so much this is largely an observation from one of the students that there is the description of plague in homer's iliad where you see how mm. apollo curses the greeks with the plague uh, mm -hmm. so does that you know yes. that idea across remains same probably that's what uh, yes of course to... you see you see the entire you know uh, the greek literature and you know uh, probably it's homer who came up with the idea of epidemic the coinage you know and uh, you see uh, this entire cursing the scourge of the gods you know the greeks with plague for having cheated you know the trojans this is there uh, uh, from uh, the beginning you know so this entire uh, epic is uh, riddled you know ridden with plague so that is there uh, in all the epics if i had time definitely i would have talked about this and uh, you can see parallels with oedipus as i was saying that yes therefore you know a plague becomes a kind of a punishment of the gods therefore for uh ethical i would say more ethical issues moral you know degradation uh rather than you know uh, to having to do anything which is uh, more scientific as in our i would say uh, this contemporary environment uh, yes you are right uh, gautam biswas you are right in your observation so okay. uh since sir is here sir do you have anything to ask 
So, I think uh, Shomi sir, I just had one question. Like you know, since we yes. were bringing in uh, uh, Tagore and Shakespeare together, mm -hmm. both of them, mm -hmm. you know, having personal losses, having lost their children mm -hmm. to the plague. Yeah. You know, how do you think you know their approach to this you know uh, pandemic in that way um, mm -hmm. becomes a kind of I, I believe a, a kind of a psychological resolution or a kind of a yes. lesson that we can probably uh, look forward to. Uh, is there any kind of a difference in the way that they are approaching the plague? You know, subtle difference, or it is, you know, more or less. Uh, you see, you see, I feel you know, Tagore was still involved. You know, uh, there's a subtle difference, definitely. That you know, mm -hmm. uh, Tagore faced it more squarely. I think so. He was involved. You know, in sort of you know, saving, uh, working directly, and he was talking about it very squarely. Whereas you see uh, Shakespeare, uh, he faced so much, but he often, you know, dealt with it symbolically. You know, I don't say he's an escapist, but uh, he thought probably uh, that you know the um, the plague uh, would be an inevitable truth, a part of a life which has to carry on. You know, flow. It's nothing so special. You know, it will come and go. Whereas you know Tagore. Uh, had an anxiety, coped up with it, and then got into a resolution while he finally accepted it. So, you know, that kind of, I would say, that complexity of emotion, that probably, I, I don't say it's missing, but, you know, the logical up and down, thesis, antithesis is missing in Shakespeare. For Shakespeare, it, it was, as I, I was mentioning, you know, it often became comic. So, you know, uh, he, he, he was okay with it. It was okay. His own street, you know, the silver street where he stayed, you know, his uh, own landlady, she had the plague. So, you know, and uh, Shakespeare uh, remained with it, coped with it. So that, that would be my opinion of it. Pritha Banerjee comes with an interesting question, but I think that would yes. take you another lecture. But very briefly, could you comment on the changes uh, in this uh, representation? Uh, 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 uh across the text Especially studied by you. individual and the subjective. Just a minute, I read the question. Uh, ah. And subjective with the larger social currents of each time. Could you comment on the changes? Oh, goodness me. This is this will take some time. I mean, yes, yes, uh, I think. Uh, uh, so, uh, the, uh, definitely, you see the... Uh, as we say, you know, the personal is political sometimes, you know. So uh, you see what we, uh, what uh, I would say is personal, you know, uh, it, uh, uh, it, it, it moves out and engages, you know, with the larger social currents of the time. And therefore, you know, uh, often personal tragedies, as we have seen in Tagore, as we have seen in Shakespeare and the stray, you know, uh, uh, authors and the people I've talked about probably, uh, they have come out of their individual crisis, I would say, the subjective ideas, and have linked to the social pressures of the times and have probably uh, answered back to the society, a sort of, I would say, uh, a, um, a panacea, a cure as to how to cope up with this crisis. So, you see, uh, the uh, there is a constant, you know, shuffling between the individual and how to cope up with this the troubles and uh, how to connect with the larger realities so as it becomes a sort of a prescription okay so that is what the authors basically do good authors you know uh, important authors you know how uh, they negotiate with this i mean i i can go on but uh, this is in a nutshell yes yes i can understand that mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah thank you so much uh, ma'am for this wonderful uh, evening that we had with you because it was uh, quite a journey you know moving uh, through an array of different uh, kinds of work so thank you so much for being with us and thank you for this wonderful thank you evening too. thank you yes. too for giving me this opportunity and uh, i will probably remain in the background listening to shubhajit uh, right, right. thank you ma'am thank you yeah. be there okay um, mm. we move on to our next speaker now mm -hmm. i would invite my uh, friend and colleague uh, from the department, uh, Dr. Tathagato Dash, to please introduce the second speaker of the day, uh, Tathagato. Uh, thank you, Madhumita. Uh, good evening, everyone. And 
thank you ma'am for your wonderful lecture i really enjoyed it now uh, it's thank my you too. special yes uh, it's my special privilege and honor to introduce to you uh, our second speaker dr shubhajit shengupto dr shubhajit shengupto began his career in the academia in 1999 and he is presently associate professor and head in the department of english and culture studies the university of badwa he is passionate about shakespeare and the european renaissance and his doctoral thesis for which he received his phd degree in the year 2006 was titled genre and meaning in shakespeare's histories he is a member of the shakespeare society of india and has uh, he has been earlier a member of the british shakespeare association as well his other interests include 18th century british literature and culture and post modern literature and culture besides dr shengupto loves poetry theater sports painting and photography uh he will be speaking on the title is literature inspired by the plague of 1603 with special reference to james the first decca and shakespeare so uh may i formally invite dr shubhajit shengupta sir uh, so please sir proceed with your presentation uh, we are eagerly waiting for uh, to listen to you thank you sir it's all yours, very sir. warm good evening <coughs> very warm good evening to everyone here now i have to make a presentation so i need to share the screen i'll try to put the powerpoint screen on uh, just give me a couple of minutes to do that i'll try to get things right uh as shubhajit sir actually arranges his uh, powerpoint and gets back and i would like to add this personal note personally i am a huge fan of his i mean like you would uh, see um, his uh oration about uh, shakespeare pieces now and then i mean like this has been a formal occasion to communicate with him but this goes back years ago before i actually uh, know him personally and what a wonderful painter he is i mean the last uh, ode to i believe to gavaskar's life was there and i mean like if any one of you actually go and uh, see it on his fb page it would be um, an experience in itself so looking forward to you Thank you, Motimita. Those are very kind words. Now, has this appeared on the screen? This PowerPoint slide. I mean, like you uh, share it again. I'll accept it, like we did yesterday, I believe. All, all right. Yes. Now, yeah. I have put it there. It's. Uh, I've started sharing it, and I'm waiting for you to accept it. Yes, I've done that. All right. Thank you. So I've it's done visible now. Yeah, I've done. That. yeah all right thank you now i have shortened the title of uh, this uh, presentation i reckon i'll have roughly uh, 35 to 40 minutes to finish the presentation now i have decided to call it the plague of 1603 and the writing it inspired now this is uh, essentially uh, a slight modification of a presentation that i made a couple of months ago at another webinar and uh, this is largely because uh, um, many of uh, those who had uh, tuned in to listen to that webinar presentation um had uh, wanted to hear it again and the other reason perhaps the more important reason why i did not go in for anything absolutely new and fresh is that uh, i didn't really honestly speaking have the time to do that much as i would have liked to do it but then i think that this is a uh, uh, an important um um way of uh, responding to the present uh, pandemic that we are passing through and we are passing through as important a moment as important a crisis in history as uh, people in london and in other parts of england did in the early part of the 17th century and as i will try to uh, tell you over the next half an hour or a little more than that this plague of 1603 this was one of the several bouts of plague that struck england uh, during the 
a period ranging from the late medieval age to the uh, late Renaissance. And this was only one of them, but this was a terrible plague and it inspired some considerable amount of writing. And um, just in the, in the way that this plague of 1603 inspired uh, literature of uh, some considerable quality, uh, the present pandemic has also started inspiring literature, not only literature, but also uh, academic discussions, discussions uh, within the medical profession, um, discussions on social media, and of course, uh, these webinars. And so here we go, The Plague of 1603 and the writing it inspired. Now, between the Black Death of, um, I'll try to just put it on the slideshow mode. Let's see. All right. Now, between, these are the London plagues uh, between six, 1348 and 1665. And uh, between what was called the Black Death, the infamous, the infamous Black Death of 1348 and the Great Plague of 1665, of which uh, Daniel Diffo was to write in his uh, book called The Journal of the Plague Year, there were nearly 40 plagues in London, and most people believe that the plague that struck London from the 1300s to the late years of uh, the 17th century was the bubonic plague. It was a disease caused primarily by rats, such as black rats. Of course, the idea at all that it was being caused by black rats and most people believed that it was some kind of divine punishment inflicted on man by God and um, as was discovered later the disease was caused primarily by rodents such as black rats and passed between them and flea bites now when a rat dies from the plague it's fleas must find a new host to survive upon. And if this new host happens to be a human being, the disease then can spread to humans. The most common symptoms of the bubonic plague were headaches, fever, vomiting, painful swellings on the neck, armpits and groin, and blisters and bruises, and coughing up blood. During Shakespeare's time, um, Shakespeare, of course, as we know, was living through the 1603 plague. He was born uh, in 1564, died in 1616. So uh, he was uh, roughly in his uh, middle age at the time of the 1603 plague. And during Shakespeare's lifetime, the plague outbreaks in 1563, which is only a year before Shakespeare's birth, and 1603, which is the plague that I'll be focusing on, were the most lethal. And each of these two plagues wiped out over one quarter of London's population. Besides the plague, there were other major diseases in Shakespeare's time, and I believe I should make a brief mention of them. Among these were smallpox, syphilis, typhus, malaria, which is also, or which at that time was also called the ague. There are references uh, to the ague in Macbeth and in Twelfth Night, uh, among other texts of the time. Um, Andrew Ague Cheek, for example, in Twelfth Night uh, has uh, cheeks that are sunken in and it was believed at that time that malaria could cause uh, the cheeks to, to sink in and uh, a person afflicted with the ague or with malaria could therefore be easily identified by his looks. And ague cheek, irrespective of whether he was actually struck by the ague or not, has that kind of sunken cheeks. So he's called ague cheek. Um, 
there was Crofula, which was also called the evil, or sometimes king's evil, and this again is referred to in Macbeth. 1603 in Shakespeare's England has been described by Thomas Decker as wonderful ear in a best-selling pamphlet, which is perhaps uh, uh, one of the most famous uh, pieces of writing on the 1603 plague, and I'll dwell on this uh, a little later. Now, what were the things that happened, the important things in 1603? Queen Elizabeth I, who had been on the throne since 1558, died on the 24th of March that year. And in the absence of an heir, King James VI of Scotland became King James I of England. And shortly thereafter, there was this terrible outbreak of plague, uh, claiming around a quarter of London's population. And it swept not only through the great city, but also through the surrounding countryside. James I issued a book of orders. It was called Orders, and it was about the outbreak of the plague. And it was a kind of, uh, uh, it, wa it, was a, it was a book that carried a series of instructions about the things that one ought to do and the things that one ought not to do during the plague. And this uh, is uh, the title page of the book. And there's a copy of this book in the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust Library in Stratford-upon-Avon. It's called in the title page, Orders Thought Meet, that is thought appropriate, by His Majesty and His Privy Council to be executed throughout the counties of this realm in such towns, villages, and other places as are or may be hereafter infected with the plague for the stay or further increase of the for, for the stay of further increase of the same that is for the prevention of any increase of the plague the first half of the text of this book orders speaks of orders enforced to control the plague in and around london and this is followed in the second half of the book by mentions of several preventative and remedial cures recommended by doctors, uh, providing uh, thereby um, a glimpse of uh, early modern medicine and cures. Now, some of these remedial cures were as follows. Uh, uh, I have here a short catalogue of sorts of these cures that were popular in the early modern period, correcting the humours, the humours that Ben Jonson so ardently believed in. And indeed, when I talk of writings inspired by the plague, I'll be referring a little later to one of uh, Ben Jonson's poems. Now, correcting the humours through purging and bloodletting. Number two, herbal remedies. Number three, pregnant women were advised to eat toast covered in vinegar, butter and cinnamon. Number four, the poor were told that they, and I'm quoting here, may eat bread and butter alone. I'm quoting from the orders. And butter was seen as a preservative against the plague. Five, those already suffering from plague sores could, to cure them, uh, could cure them, sorry, that's a typo, could cure them with a warm with a warmed mixture of onions, butter and garlic. And if one could not afford even that, there were many poor people who couldn't afford even that. And if that were so, then one could simply lay, I'm quoting again, a load of bread to the sore, uh, hot as it cometh out of the oven. Next, People actually believed in these cures, and the final point that I've made here is that while going out of doors, people were advised to hold herbs in their hands or drape a vinegar-draped handkerchief around their mouths and nostrils, a rather a primitive, archaic version of the modern-day masks that we have been advised to wear. Now, this is uh, an interesting a picture on, on, on the left, on the extreme left. Um, don't worry about the pictures in the middle and on the right. The picture in the middle, of course, is James I and it's Shakespeare 
on the extreme right. But on the left, we have a plague doctor of the early uh, 17th century. And the clothing worn by plague doctors was intended to protect them from airborne diseases and was introduced uh, around 1619. So now this, this kind of clothing might not therefore have been worn during the 1603 plague by doctors, but within the next two decades, this sort of clothing became popular. And once it was introduced, physicians took to wearing this kind of clothing. And of particular interest here is the, is the beak shape around the area of the nose. And this was not only a beak, this was no hollow beak. This beak was stuffed with aromatic herbs uh, such as lavender. Now, let us take a look at the book I briefly mentioned uh, a while ago, Thomas Decker's book, The Wonderful Year. And this was uh, a book about 1603, not only about the plague, but also about the two other important uh, events of 1603, the death of Elizabeth and the coronation of James I as the first Stuart King of England. And this is the title page, um, The Wonderful Year 1603, wherein is showed the picture of London lying sick of the plague at the end of all like a merry epilogue to a dull play certain tales are cut out in sundry fashions of purpose to shorten the lives of long winter's nights that by watching in the dark for us but that that lie watching in the dark for us and this was printed in london by thomas creed and as we are told towards the bottom uh, the book was to be sold in uh, St. Dontoni's churchyard in Fleet Street in London. Now, Decker has this to write about Elizabeth's death. The summons made her start. The spelling in this quotation is of the early modern period. The summons, the call of death, the summons from heaven is what Decker is talking about. Now, although this is not really related to the plague, um, I am uh, uh, quoting uh, this, this portion from uh, Decker's book because I believe that uh, we should look at 603 um, holistically and not just focus on the plague. And we should also take note of the other things that were happening around the plague. And one of these was the death of Elizabeth, a very significant incident, not only in 1603, but also in entire English history. The summons made her start, but having an invincible spirit did not amaze her. Of course, this is Decker's imagination. He's imagining that the summons from heaven made the uh, sick Elizabeth start, but it didn't amaze her because she had an invincible spirit. Yet whom would not be, would not the certain news of parting from a kingdom amaze? Yet she might have been amazed to a certain degree because after all she was having to part from her earthly kingdom, but she knew where to find a richer and therefore likely regarded the loss of this and thereupon made ready for that heavenly coronation being which was most strange most dutiful to obey that had so many years so powerfully commanded so elizabeth who had so powerfully commanded for so many years this earthly kingdom here in england was now being called for her heavenly coronation she obeyed death's messenger and yielded her body to the hands of death himself. She dies, resigning her scepter to posterity and her soul to immortality. And Decker goes on to write uh, also on the accession of James I to the English throne. For behold, up rises a comfortable sun out of the north, 
whose glorious beams like a fan dispersed all thick and contagious clouds. And of particular interest to me here is the use of the word contagious, dispersed all thick and contagious clouds. And I am not sure, but Decker could be insinuating that uh, uh, James I's rise to the throne could uh, disperse or deflect the plague. The loss of a queen was paid with the double interest of a king and queen. The imagery, of course, is from business, uh, paying someone with interest. And the queen, of course, uh, had never married and uh, she was alone on the throne. But now we have a king and a queen since James I had a, da a Danish wife. James I's coronation, however, had to be postponed because of the outbreak of the plague in 1603. And this is uh, where Decker uh, is writing on the plague of 1603. A stiff and freezing horror sucks up the rivers of my blood. My hair stands an end with the panting of my brains. Mine eyeballs are ready to start out, being beaten with the billows of my tears. Now, uh, I found the uh, images in these lines strikingly similar to uh, some of the images uh, that Macbeth uses. And Shakespeare wrote Macbeth three years later uh, in 606. Uh, uh, Macbeth, once he receives uh, news from Angus and Ross that he has been made the Thane of Cawdor, this is in Act 1, Scene 3, begins to contemplate kingship. And he says, two truths are told, referring to the titles of the Thane of Glams and the Thane of Cawdor, as happy prologues to the swelling act of the imperial theme. And then he goes on to say that as he contemplates the murder of Duncan, he doesn't say it in so many words, but he hints at that, uh, he, his hair stands on end, he says, and uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he, he's, I'll just uh, uh, refer you to the lines from Macbeth, uh, I have the text with me here, he says, uh, why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix uh, my, uh, just a moment, uh, Yes. Uh, here we are. Whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature. And then uh, here where Decker is speaking of his eyeballs being ready to start out, we again anticipate Macbeth's uh, words uh, when the witches uh, display to him the show of kings. We have a series of uh, the ancestors of James I, and among them is the dead Banquo, and the vision uh, terrifies Macbeth, and he says that his eyes begin to start from their spheres. But I'm not sure, of course, if Shakespeare was actually uh, uh, alluding in any way or having in mind these words that Decker wrote about his response to the plague. This could be mere speculation. So yes, uh, here we go again from the start. Uh, Decker writing on the plague of 1603. A stiff and freezing horror sucks up the rivers of my blood. My hair stands an end with the panting of my brains. Mine eyeballs are ready to start out being beaten with the billows of my tears. Out of my weeping pen does the ink mournfully and more bitterly than gall drop on the pale-faced paper, even when I do but think how the bowels of my sick country have been torn. Apollo, therefore, and you bewitching silver-tongued muses, get you gone. Invocate none of your names. Sorrow and truth sit you on each side of me, whilst I am delivered of this deadly burden. Prompt me that I may utter ruthful and passionate condolement. 
arm my trembling hand that it may boldly rip up and anatomize the ulcerous body of this anthropophagized plague. Now, of course, uh, this is uh, an inversion of uh, the uh, conventional invocation to the muse in an epic where the poet seeks inspiration to write a poem of as great magnitude as an epic. And what is Decker saying here? Uh, because he is so cynical about what's happening in his country. He's so cynical about life itself. He says, even when I do but think how the bowels of my sick country have been torn, Apollo, therefore, and you bewitching silver-tongued muses, get you gone. Invocate none of your names. He says that he will not invoke the muses. Whom shall Decker invoke then? if he has to write about the plague. He is not writing an epic, he's writing about the plague. And so he will invoke the emotions of grief, sorrow, he says, and truth. He will be honest and forthright about the plague and represent, it, it, uh, represent the plague in all its graphic details. Sorrow and truth sit you on each side of me whilst I am delivered of this deadly burden. So for him, this writing, this act of writing about the plague is not something that he delights in. It's a burden that he carries, this knowledge of the plague, and he has to shed this burden. How can he do it other than by writing about it? So writing about the plague has some sort of a, sort of a cathartic effect, if I may use that word, upon Decker. He is delivering himself of this deadly burden of the knowledge of the plague, the truth about the plague and the sorrow that the plague has inspired in him. And therefore, uh, instead of the muses of poetry, the muses of writing, he is invoking sorrow and truth and asking them to seat on either side of him so that flanked by sorrow and truth, he may go on to write about the plague. Prompt me, he says, to sorrow and truth, having personified them, he says, prompt me that I may utter ruthful and passionate condolement, arm my trembling hand. The rhetoric, please note, is that of an epic poet invoking the muse. Arm my trembling hand, that it may boldly rip up and anatomize uh, the body of the plague, he says. That's where uh, the text begins to differ from the kind of text that uh, a writer of an epic would write. And he goes on to say, lend me art without any counterfeit shadowing. Uh, he has invoked truth, mind you, to paint and delineate to the life the whole story of this mortal and pestiferous battle. And you, the ghosts of those more by many than 40,000, he's referring to people who have died that with the virulent poison of infection have been driven out of your earthly dwellings. You desolate, hand-wringing widows that beat your bosoms over your departing husbands. You woefully distracted mothers that with disheveled hair fallen into swoons, whilst you lie kissing the insensible cold lips of your breathless infants. You outcast and downtrodden orphans. And it goes on. Decker invokes James, importantly and significantly, as Apollo and as England's healing physician. And the representation may be interpreted as part of a Jacobean propaganda to counter Catholic rumour that James's rise to the throne in England had brought the wrath of God on England. And in later pamphlets, uh, Decker himself explained the plague epidemic as God's way of making England pay for the sins committed in the previous reign of Elizabeth. And this, of course, as you understand, was politically very, very significant. Plague is also, importantly, accorded in Decker's work a positive, regenerative role. It helps, Decker writes, to get rid of sins and of the excess population, which at one time had produced famine. There was also possibly the need to help James I recover 
from the embarrassment of having his kingship in England always associated with the outbreak of the 1603 plague. And so Decker might have felt compelled to write some of the things that he wrote, uh, including the invocation of James as Apollo and as England's healing physician. Now, towards the end of this pamphlet, Decker offers in verse a grave warning. Tis now the beggar's plague, for none are in this battle overthrown but babes and poor. That's poor people, that is. The lesser fly now in the spider's web doth lie. But if that great and goodly swarm, the runaways, that has broke through, through fleeing and felt no harm in his envenomed What is saying is that if, uh, is that if uh, those who had escaped from London, the runaways, if somehow they uh, happened to get uh, trapped in the venomous snares of the plague, uh, as uh, those who hadn't been able to escape had done, at least most of them, then that would be very, very tragic. Now, I'll refer you to a book uh, that was written in uh, classical Rome by Lucretius, called De Redum Natura, translated into English as The Order of Things, and available now uh, in uh, modern editions, including the one being sold by Penguin. And uh, this was written during a very politically turbulent period uh, in Rome during the first century BC. And Lucretius argues here that supernatural explanations of fearful occurrences such as earthquakes and thunderstorms and floods and plagues were potential tools in the hands of power-hungry priests and politicians. Um, power-hungry priests and politicians. And Lucretius attempted to neutralize the supposed horrors of the unknown by offering rational explanations, by offering natural explanations. And Lucretius's book, De Redem Natura, as uh, the new historicist critic Stephen Greenblatt writes in his Booker Prize-winning book called The Swerve, which is a book about how the Renaissance began. Uh, in effect, uh, Greenblatt's book, The Swerve, is about how Lucretius's book, De Redem Natura, was instrumental in beginning, uh, um, uh, in triggering uh, a, a series of uh, uh, philosophical uh, approaches to life, which uh, resulted in the birth of the Renaissance. And Lucretius knew that the way people explain and write about disease is important, since it not only records perceptions of people about sickness, but can also influence and shape social responses. Now, rhetorical ownership and explanations of disease is extremely important. Uh, how diseases are rhetorically articulated, rhetorically explained, and how uh, the rhetorician becomes a, a kind of owner. Uh, I'm using the word owner in a very specific and specialized sense. Uh, how the rhetorician himself or herself becomes the owner in a way of the disease because he shapes people's responses to the disease by his rhetorical uh, uh, interventions into the disease. Now, 16th and early 17th century discourses about the plague, um, the word about is missing on the screen, again, a typo. And these discourses reveal a complex interplay between religion, and politics, and medicine. And quoting from the biblical book of Samuel, uh, Henoch Clapham wrote in 1603, famine, sword, and pestilence are a trinity of punishments prepared of the Lord for consuming a people that have sinned against him. Uh, in the 16th century, famine, civil war, pestilence, uh, these were strategically and rhetorically construed as God's scourges or his plagues to punish a sinful people. In 1539, almost uh, 
uh, a century before the 1603 plague, Sir Thomas Eliot in Castle of Health had written, moreover, receive not into your house any stuff that cometh out of a house wherein any person hath been infected. He was, of course, referring to the older plagues. Uh, but there I always uh, accept the power of God, which is wonderful and also merciful, above man's reason and counsel, preserving or striking whom, when and where it shall like his majesty. His majesty here, of course, is God. He is essentially saying that it is God's will. It is up to God to decide who shall be infected and who shall survive. But of course, it begins with a warning, a commonsensical warning to uh, people. Now, there were penal sanctions uh, and earthly uh, punishment as well as divine punishment uh, for transgression. Let's have a look at this. In 1603, Robert Cecil warned people about the city's unruly infected. And he argued in favor of sharper punishment to control the infected because he believed that the infected were actually uh, receiving God's punishment and therefore deserved sharper punishment, not only from God, but also from the human perpetrators of punishment. The next year, uh, there was this policy of isolating the infected and this policy was backed up by penal sanctions. Anyone with a plague sore found wandering outside could be whipped if he were alone and hanged if he were found in the company of people. Writers were encouraged to write about contagion and about measures to control it. Manning uh, wrote a medical regimen in 1604 and there he wrote, may not they be condemned for murderers, which having plague sores will press into companies to infect others or willfully pollute the air or other means which others are daily to use and live by. Manning suggests that keeping the body under strict control is both a godly and a civic obligation, a duty towards God and a duty towards humans. And failure to do this would invite, would invite both divine retribution and civic punishment. Mary Douglas uh, was an anthropologist and in a work called Purity and Danger, she argues that the rhetoric of contagion and exclusion in writings um, of, of, on the plague. Um, uh, Mary Douglas, of course, is a recent anthropologist and in this book called Purity and Danger, she argues that the rhetoric of contagion and exclusion in writings on the plague has more to do with the need to impose order on society than with controlling the disease. And she suggests an extricable link between biological and social issues. She writes, ideas about separating, purifying, demarcating and punishing transgressions have as their main function to impose system on an inherently untidy experience. It is only by exaggerating the difference between within and without, above and below, with and against, etc., that a semblance of order is created. Now, I'll talk about some of these uh, literary texts uh, that uh, spawned as a result of the plague. First, this uh, very tragic incident that led to Ben Johnson writing a short poem called On My First Son. First, of course, meaning his eldest son, who was also called Ben, short for Benjamin. Uh, father and son shared the same name, father and eldest son. And this is a compelling short poem about the death of his eldest son during the 1603 London plague. Now, Ben Johnson left London before the plague started in 1603 and he went to stay at a country house. Um, and he was, uh, as the plague began to uh, spread through London, he began to uh, grow very worried about his eldest son, particularly Benjamin, because he had, uh, uh, he had had a dream in which he had seen Benjamin, who was then only a child of around seven or eight, with the mark of a bloody cross on his forehead, as if he had been struck there with a sword. And this was almost prophetic because the red cross was the sign that was put on houses struck by the plague. And shortly afterwards, Johnson received a letter from his wife telling him 
that Benjamin had died and he wrote this very moving poem on my first son. Uh, Shakespeare, of course, has uh, had much to do with the plague as Shurmishta was uh, telling us. I'm very sorry, Shurmishta, that I couldn't hear your paper in its entirety. That's uh, my loss. Now, as an infant, Shakespeare was lucky to survive the disease. Stratford-upon-Avon was ravaged by a huge outbreak of plague in the summer of 1564, a few months after Shakespeare was born, and up to a quarter of the town's population died, including four children on the very street of Shakespeare's birthplace, Henley Street, where the birthplace now stands and is uh, visited by thousands of tourists. In 1592, there was another outbreak of plague that caused the theatres to temporarily close down. With reduced numbers of performances, Shakespeare spent his time writing poetry and Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucrezia were written during this time. Pestilence, in spite of Shakespeare's experiences of it in real life, is uh, uh, neither, uh, I'm sorry, it's not either, it's neither, is it's neither explicit nor frequent in his plays. However, there are a few plays that make references to the plague. Uh, there are a few others which I have not mentioned in this presentation, but here are a few important ones. Romeo and Juliet, written in 1595. Um, now here, Shakespeare uses the plague to shape a crucial part of the plot of Romeo and Juliet. There's an outbreak of the plague in the play, and it delays Friar Lawrence's messenger, and this means that Romeo does not come to know of Juliet's plan, and this triggers of, if you have read Romeo and Juliet, you will know what I'm talking about, and this, this uh, delay triggers off uh, the chain of events that culminates in the accidental deaths of the two lovers, and the messenger uh, says, uh, this is uh, scene three in act five, towards the end of the play, the searchers of the town suspecting that we both were in a house where the infectious pestilence did reign, sealed up the doors and would not let us forth. The searchers, of course, were people who had been employed to take note of uh, infected persons that would be wandering in the streets. Romeo and Juliet is a play where we have another reference to the plague and Mercutio at the moment of his death, cries out, a plague on both your houses, referring to uh, the Capulets and the Montagues. Uh, in the first quarter version of the play, the word was pox instead of plague, but when the play was uh, uh, performed in 1595, uh, the word was changed to plague, probably because there had been, shortly before that, an outbreak of the plague. Now, after the outbreak of the 1603 plague, performances by Shakespeare's acting company became infrequent. Measure for Measure was probably written around 1603 or 1604. The play is set in a Vienna, heavily afflicted with disease, both literal and metaphorical. And Shakespeare depicts the London of his own time, brothels and bars abruptly closed, shut down by an autocratic government, as they so often were in real England. Timon of Athens is a play which culminates in a man sending himself into exile and he keeps talking of diseases, Timon. Plagues, he says, you potent and infectious fevers heap on Athens. Be crowned with plagues, send them back the plague. These are lines, the words that we find in, in Timon of Athens. I'm only trying to point out, rather sketchily, I'm sorry, uh, how Shakespeare, while not making any explicit or any extended reference to the plague, uh, was actually uh, referring, alluding to the play sporadically across the canon. In Macbeth, which was possibly written uh, during uh, the next bout of plague in 1606, Ross says at one point he is describing Scotland when he reaches England and meets Macduff and Malcolm there, and he describes Scotland where he says, I quote, the dead man's knell is there scarce asked for who, and good men's lives expire before the flowers in their caps, dying or ere they sicken. 
Now, James Shapiro has a book called The Year of Lear. It's called 606, The Year of Lear. Now, Macbeth and Lear both were written in 606. And James Shapiro also has a book about 1599, which was an important year for Shakespeare because the Globe Theatre was built that year. Now, in this book, 1606, The Year of Lear, Shapiro writes, though less than four lines long, there's probably not a better description of the terror and malaise the plague carried with it. And he's referring to Ross's uh, lines uh, in Macbeth. King Lear, uh, in Shakespeare's King Lear, uh, uh, Kent curses Goneril's servant Oswald, uh, telling him a plague upon your epileptic visage. And Lear himself uh, talks about uh, the plagues that hang in this pendulous air. At that time, it was believed that uh, the plague could spread by airborne transmission, which, of course, uh, has uh, since been proved wrong. And Lear also calls Goneril a plague sore, an embossed carbuncle in my corrupted blood. And towards the end of the play, um, when Lear carries uh, Gon uh, Cordelia's dead body onto the stage, he says to the people on the stage, uh, a plague upon you, etc., etc. I could have saved her, he says. But of course, uh, he's carrying the lifeless body of Cordelia. She's beyond uh, cure now. Now, this uh, is the kind of writing, therefore, that the plague inspired in England, the deadly plague of 1603. But of course, I have made a few uh, casual references to uh, the plagues before the 1603 plague and the one after that, the one immediately after that, uh, the 1606 plague. And Ross, uh, where he talks about the dead man's nail being uh, scarce, asked for who is perhaps referring not so much to the 1603 plague, whose memory was still fresh, uh, uh, but perhaps to the more immediate plague of 1606. That's just about all that I have time for. Thank you very much for patiently listening to me. And I must thank the Department of English of uh, Bhangur Mahabidyalaya and uh, the rest of the organizers for having invited me and made this uh, uh, wonderful webinar. Uh, thank you, Shubhajitda, for that wonderful lecture. We do have a few questions. Uh, Tathagatada, could you take this up, please? I'm putting the question up there for you. Uh, yes, uh, there's a question for you, Shubhajitda. Uh, it's by Ritha Banerjee. Uh, she's asking that, uh, uh, do you think the fact that Decker did not fall sick himself uh, is an important factor in the way he writes or in the way we read Decker? So that's the question, sir. Uh, sorry, uh, would you please repeat? Uh all right, it has appeared on the screen. Ah, yeah. uh, all right, I, I don't really know how to respond to this question, Preetha. Uh, this could be true of any writer writing about the plague or about the present pandemic. Yes, Decker did not fall sick. Um, and of course, uh, though he did not fall sick, he was not struck by the plague, true. But he does feel sick, doesn't he, in other ways. In other ways, he does feel sick. And he talks about that kind of sickness. It's not sickness caused by the plague, but it's the sickness of the heart. It's the sickness of the mind, the brain. He talks about uh, his hair uh, starting on end. He talks about his eyes popping out. He talks about... Uh, the great burden that he was carrying and the need he felt to relieve himself of that burden. And that to me is a kind of sickness. And of course, uh, if you are talking about that kind of sickness, the kind of sickness that I'm talking about, if you think about that, that certainly shapes the kind of writing that Dekker produced. Um, now, so far as our reading of Dekker is concerned, I'm not very sure because different people will have different uh, ways of uh, reading Decker. We cannot homogenize the act of reading. My reading of Decker 
may be different from someone else's reading of Decker. But so far as the way Decker writes is concerned, of course, uh, yes, it is shaped by the kind of sickness that I'm talking about. Sickness caused, a sickness of the heart, a sickness of the mind, caused by an acute consciousness of the enormous destruction that the plague was causing in England. The toll that it took uh, on, on his conscience was enormous, as enormous as the, the um, enormity of uh, uh, or the huge number of lives that, that were sacrificed to, to the plague. I'm not sure, Preeta, if you find this answer to your satisfaction, but at the moment, this is all that I can think of telling you. Should I respond to the next question? Yes, yes. Uh, so this is, yes. uh, uh, I'll read the question myself. If we compare plague and COVID-19, what will be the most influential in our literature? Shall we believe in astrology, as some writers already have written about COVID-19? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I personally do not believe in astrology. I wouldn't really recommend that. But of course, uh, if someone chooses to disregard what I recommend and what I do not recommend, <clears throat> I think uh, we lost uh, the network connection with uh, Shubhajitha. That was anyway the last question that we had for the session. Uh, uh, let us just wait a bit. Yes, I think. Yeah. Was, was there a disruption? Uh, yes, there was a disruption. Uh, yes. what, I, what I said during the moments that there was this disruption was that uh, I, I will not recommend astrology as something to believe in but that's my personal opinion now if someone chooses to disregard that if someone really believes in astrology i cannot intervene in such matters and in such beliefs so uh, to that part of the question this is all that i have to say now my response to the first part of the question regarding how influential uh, literature written in response to covid19 is going to be well i think it's going to be very very influential and uh, the body of literature written in response to COVID-19 will obviously be much, much larger than the body of literature that was written in response to the older plagues in, in England. And uh, COVID-19 Yes, please. Yeah. COVID-19 Yes, I, I, I did have a question. Like, yes, yes, please, please. I was wondering, you know, uh, because... Uh, uh, when Shakespeare was writing in the time of uh, Queen Elizabeth, I think uh, the body of economics uh, was perhaps uh, quite different, you know, and from this movement from being the Chamberlain's men to King's men, you know, and being offered £10, uh, you know, per performance. Do you think that also uh, made uh, Shakespeare a little restrictive because James Wan's own response to plague was perhaps... Uh, different from that of uh, Queen Elizabeth. Do you think that is also uh, making him just refer to plagues, you know, uh, in the Jacobian period? You do have references, exclamations, but not really using them as a strategic part of uh, the play that was used uh, in Romeo, Juliet, uh, etc. So do you think that also has to do with the kind of monarchs uh, under whom he was writing or during that uh, reign in which he was writing? Now, any answer, Modimita, that I could give to you to that question would be entirely speculative. Um, Shakespeare could have made these uh, references to the plague very scanty in his Jacobean plays because of reasons that you are suggesting, while in an older play written during the time of Elizabeth, such as Romeo and Juliet, he made the plague instrumental in shaping an important part of the plot, a very decisive part of the plot. Now, whether or not uh, the entirely different uh, attitude to James towards uh, playgoing and performances of plays had anything to do with it is best left to speculation. Um, now, one uh, observation that I may make here 
is that uh, the mature Shakespeare of James's England, um, Romeo and Juliet was a very early play. Now, the mature Shakespeare of James's England, and remember Shakespeare wrote some of his best plays when James was king. Um, this Shakespeare, that we probably like uh, most artists, was reluctant to make too many explicit references to a phenomenon, a disease, that everyone was, and even today, forever, will remain uncomfortable with. Now, I don't think that writers and artists are very comfortable writing about diseases. They cannot be comfortable. They may have some sort of social obligation uh, when it comes to writing about diseases and talking about diseases, making that a part of the literature that they're writing. But no one can be really very happy doing this. And remember, Shakespeare was not writing novels. Um, he was uh, not writing poems either for the major part of his career. He was writing plays. And it was an England already ravaged by the plague, the deadly plague of 1603. And if in the plays that he wrote after that, Macbeth and King Lear, plays of that sort, he were to make too many explicit references to the plague, and if those were to be shown on the stage in the public theatres, I'm not sure how well, how kindly um, such uh, representations would have been received by live audiences. And Shakespeare was looking to uh, making money out of his plays. He was uh, a businessman, essentially, and he did make a lot of money from his plays. So he had to take care about what he was showing on the stage and whether that would go down well with the audience. And besides, the other reason, of course, the more politically uh, uh, relevant reason, is that he didn't really want to have much to do with the plague, perhaps because, as I was suggesting during my presentation, he didn't want to make much fuss about it during James's time, because there were already um, rumors doing the rounds, beliefs that uh, James's rise to the throne had much to do with the outbreak of the plague, and much was being done by Decker in his pamphlet to, to distill that, to neutralize that, that sort of uh, belief. And Shakespeare would have upset uh, all of Decker's good efforts by um, foregrounding the plague in his plays, and he chose not to do that. But this again is speculation, Madhumita. Right. Thank you so much. Tata Kutada, do you have any question? Otherwise, we call this a day. Uh, I think there is uh, one question by, uh, by one of our uh, students. Uh, he's asking, he's Johir Mullah, he's asking, sir, why does uh, why does literature show the sadness and sick of black that should be sickness of plague or COVID-19? Why does not uh, literature encourage us to fight against plague or COVID-19? So I don't know how, uh, well, this is the question. <laughs> Javir, I, I, I appreciate your love for optimism. Um, and I'm a very optimistic person myself. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure there will be writers, uh, and there are writers uh, whom you or I might not have yet read, who have been writing or are trying to write uh, uh, literary texts um, or uh, producing other kinds of cultural texts, plays, uh, films, that will encourage us to fight against disease, against the present pandemic. I'm sure there are people who are trying to do that, and I appreciate your concern uh, and, and your thoughts on the subject. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this has been an extremely fruitful evening with two of our speakers, Dr. Shorbishta Chatterjee Sivasta of Aliyah University and Dr. Shubhajit Shengupta of the University of Badaman, presenting us with just not uh, insightful um, thoughts but also provoking us to think, you know, especially, um, you know, with Shor Mishtadi talking about, you know, Tagore's uh, sensibility and his way of dealing with plague and the way, you know, the part of, you know, Shakespeare also, you know, trying to optimize uh, the situation in which they were living. So these are perhaps lessons that we take back. Uh, apart from being students of literature, of course, you know, there were, you know, wonderful uh, presentations from texts, you know, 
part of the text which were quoted and presented to us, which it, you know informed us the way that perhaps two uh, greatest poets of all times, you know, had uh, dealt with this pandemic. You know, they, they have been affected by it and how they dealt with it. So thank you for that wonderful lecture. The customary vote of thanks. I take this opportunity with all humility to uh, do the honors. Um, I would thank my principal, Dr. Veer Vikram Roy. He has always been encouraging of all our endeavors. He has always been there. And the added benefit of also being part of the department is always uh, with us. This advantage is always there with us. So thank you, sir, for always leading us, guiding us. I would like to thank, of course, our two honorable speakers, Dr. Shormishta Chatterjee Shivastav and Dr. Shubhajit Shedgupta for being with us, for giving their kind time to us and, of course, uh, enriching us. Our students, you know, the chat box is filled with their enthusiasm. I can see it. I have my colleagues across colleges in West Bengal responding to this webinar, listening to it. I would like to thank with it, thank them for this uh, particular uh, time that they had given us. And, of course, I cannot do without talking about my own department. Uh, Dr. Tathagata Dash, Devdut Mukherjee, Shayantani, and Jagobundu Shorkar, they have not been just my colleagues, but they have been my support system. They have been my friends. You know, we are of different ages, of course, but then we do share a kind of a very uh, healthy board and that I always believe in after having worked a number of years, that this is a kind of an essential ingredient that perhaps keeps you working. So they're always there with me. Thank you so much for all the love and support that you always provide. I would thank all my colleagues in Bangor Mohabiddaloy. We are a one big family and you know not without reason we are having the seventh webinar of the series you know across all subjects uh today so thank you my dear colleagues thank you dear friends for being there with us stay well stay happy stay safe thank you so much i'm ending the session <laughs>